high. I had the good fortune to see The Clash play at the Aragon Ballroom in Chicago when I was a teenager. And it was an experience that changed my life. Even before the first note was played, the transformation began. I bought a t-shirt in the lobby. I was used to buying heavy metal t-shirts that had lots of pictures of garish wizards and dragons on them, but this Clash shirt was very different. It just had a few small words written over the heart. It said, the future is unwritten. And when I saw The Clash play, I knew exactly what that phrase meant. The Clash performed with passion, commitment, purpose, righteousness, and an unflinching political fire. There was such a sense of community in the room that it seemed like absolutely anything was possible. I was energized, politicized, and changed by The Clash that night. And I knew that the future was unwritten, and maybe we fans and that band were going to write it together. Joe Strummer was even playing for the same little amp that I had as a high schooler. And um, they, they, they proved to me that you didn't need a big wall of Marshall stacks and a castle on a Scottish lock to make great rock and roll music. All you had to do was tell the truth and really, really, really mean it. I've never seen a better band before that night, and I've not seen a better band since. The, that's very true. The, the Clash were one of those rare bands that were greater than the sum of their parts, and yet the parts were awesome. Mick was the brilliant arranger and tunesmith, always looking forward musically. Let's hear it for Mick, right on. <laughs> always looking forward musically and pushing the boundaries of what was possible for a punk band, of what was possible for any band. Paul was just so damn cool looking, and as you will see, is still so damn cool looking tonight. He is running it like a pimp. <laughs> and the image of him smashing the bass on the cover of London Calling sums up the fury and beautiful force of the band. He also wove in the reggae influence that completed the clash chemistry of three chords, a funky groove, and the truth. Terry Chimes provided the cavalry charge beats that pro propelled some of their early anthems, but it was Topper who made it all possible with his drumming. He effortlessly and with great originality and skill steered the band through genres undreamt of by their peers. But really, they had no peers, because at the center of the Clash hurricane stood one of the greatest hearts and deepest souls of 20th century music. At the center of the Clash stood Joe Strummer. <laughs> Joe Strummer died on December 22nd, 2002. But when Joe Strummer played, he played as if the world could be changed by a three-minute song, and he was right. Those songs changed a lot of people's worlds forever, mine at the top of the list. He was a brilliant lyricist who, with anger and wit, always stood up for the underdog. And his idealism and, and conviction instilled in me the courage to pick up a guitar and the courage to try to make a difference with it. That's true as well. In the great Clash anthem, White Riot, Joe sang, are you taking over or are you taking orders? Are you going backwards or are you going forwards? And when I heard that, I wrote those four lines down, I put them up on my refrigerator, and I answered those four questions for myself every single day. And to this day, I still do. Joe, Joe Strummer was my greatest inspiration and my favorite singer of all time and my hero. I, I miss him so much, and I was looking forward to him standing on this stage and rocking with his friends tonight, and I know that he was too. I'm, I'm grateful, though, to have the tremendous legacy of music that The Clash left behind, because through it, Joe Strummer and The Clash will continue to inspire and agitate well into the future. In fact, The Clash aren't really gone at all, because whenever a band cares more about its fans than its bank account, the spirit of The Clash is there. Whenever a band plays as if every single person's soul in the room is at stake, the spirit of the clash is there. And whenever a stadium band or a little garage band has the guts to put their beliefs on the line to make a difference, the spirit of the clash is there. And whenever, whenever people take to the streets to stop an unjust war, the spirit of the clash is definitely there.
Tonight, we will honor The Clash and Joe Strummer with toasts and applause. But the best way to honor them is by putting The Clash's philosophy into practice, by waking up each morning knowing that the future is unwritten, and that it can be a future where human rights, peace, and justice come first, but it is entirely up to us. To me, that's what The Clash was all about. They combined revolutionary sounds with revolutionary ideas. Their music launched thousands of bands and moved millions of fans, and I cannot imagine what my life would have been like without them. During their heyday, they were known as the only band that matters. And 25 years later, that still seems just about right to me. How are you doing? Um, I'm sure that the last thing that Mick or Paul or Topper or Terry or Joe Blessum would want is for me to stand up here tonight and sell you all a load of emotional hype or blarney about the clash and how fantastic they were. But um, sorry about that, lads, because that's exactly what I'm going to do. And not because they need to hear it, but because I don't think that the rest of you know just how great they really were. I love this band. And to me, without doubt, they are, next to the Stones, the greatest rock and roll band of all time. And just in case there's any of you out there who are starting to think that maybe I'm going a bit overboard, um, let me qualify that by saying, I think Elton and Elvis are in the singer-songwriter category. Um, the Beatles are obviously pop. Um, Sting, you're a sort of white reggae, different. Um, you two, I, I don't know, we're some sort of supersonic folk. But um, in rock and roll terms, The Clash are the shit. There's no one else. You know, I, I know this because I saw it back in 1977 in a small hall in Trinity College, Dublin. And it actually changed my life. Before they even came on stage, the atmosphere was so completely electric. It was like being at a prize fight or something. It was amazing. Bono was there, Adam and Larry, all the local bands. We were like 16 at the time. And uh, the first thing I noticed with a road crew, like they're roadies. They looked so incredible. They were like they'd come from some Vivian Westwood show on acid. Um, and there seemed to be hundreds of them. And they weren't doing anything, but they were just kind of wandering around on the stage with these huge mohawk hairdos and like these kilts. And we were completely mesmerized. But then when the, the lights went down, it was like the place just absolutely exploded. And it was, it was like they were possessed. They, they went into the white riot, and it was just the most intense thing anyone in that building had ever seen. The rage, the commitment. It was years later that someone explained to me about something called amphetamine sulfide. <laughs> but whatever was going on, whatever was going on, it went way past being just a rock and roll show. You know, it was, it was truly shamanistic. Um, and by the end of the night, Dublin was a different place. Something had changed. It was like the axis of the world had shifted. And if I'd woken up the next morning to find the city of Dublin in flames, I would have been less surprised than I was to discover that actually everything was the same as it had been the day before, or almost. Because for everyone there, that show was a kind of an awakening we all caught a glimpse of something, something distant but now attainable, a sense of possibilities, part political, part musical, part personal, but all completely inspirational. The revolution had come to town. And the memory of that night faded over, over time, but you know, I can't remember all the songs they played. I don't know who I was standing next to. But for years after, I could conjure up the excitement and the adrenaline of that show, and I drew on it. There is no doubt in my mind that Sunday Bloody Sunday wouldn't and couldn't have been written if it wasn't for The Clash. A, a few years later, 
our paths cross again in, the, in actually New York City this time. It was 1979, and uh, things were starting to unravel in the punk world. Uh, we were doing our first shows in, in the US, and, and The Clash were doing a, a, a string of shows in, in a theater called Bonds. I think it was something like, maybe, maybe like 10 or 20 shows. Um, because they pulled out of a big venue for reasons that are probably best forgotten. Anyway, we ended up going back to our hotel and we ran straight into the entire Clash entourage. I mean, it was amazing. There must have been like 20 punk bands crammed into the lobby of the Gramercy Park Hotel. All kinds of shapes and sizes, all dressed up, looking so cool. Um, all had their guitars in black plastic bags, I remember, because I think guitar cases were out at the time, you know, no one was using them. Anyway, uh, it was kind of intimidating in some ways, but I went over to say hello to one girl I recognized from one of the bands, and I stuck out my hand, being the polite Presbyterian lad that I am, and she took one look at it and just smacked it. She said, don't be silly, we don't do that anymore. I was like, so weird, but it was kind of a circus was in full flight. Um, and you know you could start to see that it was it was maybe taking its toll. Uh, punk was was kind of going down, and all of us who loved the Clash were starting to get worried that maybe the Clash were going to go down with it. But that didn't happen. Something much more amazing did happen. Instead of just surviving, they moved beyond punk and gave us a string of truly amazing rock and roll records: London Calling, Sandinista, and Combat Rock. full of songs really to rival the best of the best. But just when we started to think that maybe we were gonna to get to keep the best band that had come out of punk, suddenly it all seemed to come tumbling down. After eight slabs of vinyl in five years, the dream started to crumble. Looking back now, the Clash's contribution to the story of rock and roll is immense. Their contribution to the survival of rock and roll I think is unique. Because during the late 70s and early 80s, when punk was starting to wane, mainstream rock had become hopelessly and awfully redundant. The Stones had gone to disco, by the way, where most of the smart money was going at the time. The Clash, along with one or two other bands, carried the torch. They broke through barriers of perception and genre and left behind them a thousand bands in Garage Land who caught a glimpse of what they saw and strove for, including one from Ireland called U2. If they'd arrived 10 years earlier, they would have given the Beatles, the Kings, and the Stones a run for their money. If they'd arrived 10 years later, maybe they might have been able to resolve their internal conflicts and stayed the course. Either way, we might have enjoyed a few more records and tours, but you know what? They wouldn't have been the clash. So now it is my great honor and pleasure to induct The Clash into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame.